how did I find myself here? Living out my days, locked away from the life I could have had. Did the world conspire against me? Put me up to take the fall? Or was this me? What did I believe about myself? That I'm forced to be alone, that I was robbed of what I longed to have. But maybe in the end, the one who carried out the heist was me. Well, good morning, Soul City Church. Good morning. It is good to be with you, and we are in our final week of our series called The Heist. We've been looking at what robs us, what gets in the way, what causes a heist in our relationships with one another. How do we actually throw ourselves behind these bars and not experience what we all most desire? And that is depth of connection with each other. And, and I imagine, uh, as we've been walking through this series and we've been looking at all of the things that get in the way, uh, I imagine you probably thought at some point they're going to talk about vulnerability <laughs> and how vulnerability gets in the way of the relationships that we have with one another. Well, you're in luck. Today's that day. And I imagine we've all had a moment with someone when we're building a relationship. Maybe it's somebody that you're dating. Maybe it's somebody that, you know, is new in your office and somebody that you work with. Maybe it's a new friend and, and you're building a new relationship with that person. And you have that inner uncomfortability inside of you. And you start wondering, when am I going to reveal this thing about myself? Like, you know, you're figuring out all the similarities that you have. You're figuring out all your commonalities and, and you're starting to like one another and you're, you know, you're enjoying one another's company, but you have that little feeling inside, you know, that feeling that I'm talking about where you start to wonder, when am I going to let them really see me? Like, when am I going to let them really know what's going on inside here? And we all have this moment. We, we all have this kind of like, if I let them see me, will they still want to be in relationship with me? Like, will they still want to be my friend? Will they still want to go out on dates with me? Will they still let me work here at this place, right? And we have those feelings inside and we wonder, should I really let myself be seen? I remember when Jarrett and I first started dating, early on, uh, we were trying to figure one another out, right? That's kind of what you do early on in a relationship. You kind of, you know, do that little dance, like, I'm going to let them know a little bit about me, and they're going to let me know a little bit about them, and then I'll take another risk the next time, right? And you kind of do that dance for a while. And Jarrett is from California. I'm from the Midwest. And we're very, very different, if you haven't noticed that thus far. And, and early on in our dating, you know, we were starting to get to know one another. And, you know, we started telling one another about the things that, that we liked and the things that we were into, you know. And, and this is, you know, small risk vulnerability that I'm talking about right now. So, so he's from California. So he grew up skateboarding and surfing. Okay, I grew up in the Midwest with two younger brothers that played football, basketball, and baseball. So when it came to sports, he didn't know sports, and I knew sports, right? So, so, so this was a big difference in our relationship, because I kind of grew up on bleachers throughout my whole life, and he grew up on like a board that moved, and, and I didn't understand that, right? And so we had these differences. When we started learning about one another's preferences in music, I started understanding that he was into uh, old school hip hop and rap, and I listened to Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith. Okay? A little bit of a difference, right? We started talking about, like, what our ideal date was. And his ideal date was going to Chili's and ordering chips and queso. And that just wasn't a date to me at all, right? And so I remember thinking early on in the relationship, and these were small things, these were small risks, 
But I remember thinking, oh gosh, like we're really different. Like we're really, really different. And, and how do I begin to let him know? But I remember that early on I took a risk and just kind of decided like, I'm gonna let him know about me. And so I remember being so happy the first time that I told him that I had no idea what an ollie was on a skateboard. I didn't know if it was like helpful. I didn't know if it was a trick. I didn't know if it was good. I didn't know if it was bad, but he had regularly said this term, you know, when you ollie on your skateboard. And I was like, who's ollie? I, 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 don't, I don't understand what you do with the board, right? And I just kind of outed that I didn't even know what an ollie was. I remember when I said to him, listen, I don't know who a tribe called Quest is, and I don't know what they're questing. Like, I don't, know, I don't know what they're looking for, and I have a feeling I'm probably never gonna be into them. And, and, and if you wanna keep dating me, it's really important that you understand that your version of a date at Chili's is not a date. <laughs> and so I remember early on, and these were small risks, right? These were small little moments of vulnerability, but I remember that feeling inside thinking, maybe I should pretend I'm into skateboarding and surfing. Or, or maybe I should like, be like, the Beastie Boys, they're awesome, right? And I didn't know anything about the Beastie Boys. Or, or I remember thinking, like, maybe I should just pretend I really like chips and queso at Chili's. Because I liked this guy, and I wanted to stay in relationship with him, but I knew that eventually I wanted him to know me. I wanted him to see me for who I really was. And I imagine we've all had those moments in relationships where we long to let ourselves be seen or, or we want the other person to let themselves be seen. And instead of revealing who we are, we choose to hide. And instead of, of letting ourselves be seen, we put ourselves behind these bars in our relationships with one another. And instead of experiencing the gift of vulnerability, we experience the ache of hiding. And what I've come to believe is that we will never actually experience all of what our relationships are meant to be outside of vulnerability. You see, I've read countless books, I've listened to countless studies on what it is that people most desire in their relationships. You know, I have never read a study or a book that doesn't say that the top, in the top five desires of all people is the desire for vulnerability. Every single one of us wants this. You want this, don't you? You want to be able to experience vulnerability in your relationships. The problem is, is we are so scared to get it. We're so scared to actually do it with one another. But what I have come to, to find is that the true love that we long to experience with one another, and I don't just mean in a relationship that has a romantic um, tone to it, I mean any relationship. A friendship, somebody you work with, your neighbor, a family member, your children, your spouse, it doesn't matter. You long for there to be an exchange of true love with that person. And you will not experience true love in any relationship outside of vulnerability. Because true love is available when we truly become vulnerable. <laughs> That's when it happens. That's when we experience true love with one another. It's when we truly become vulnerable. It's when we're willing to show up and let ourselves be seen. I want to look at a passage in Scripture this morning that I think is a perfect and beautiful picture of what vulnerability looks like. So I'd love for you to grab your Bible here in this room in our overflow space, and even those of you that are watching online, I'd love for you to grab your Bible. I'd love for you to turn to the New Testament, the book of Luke, Luke 7, starting in verse 36. It is found on page 721 in the Gray Bible in front of you. And this is a great moment, a great picture for us of what vulnerability really looks like in a relationship. Luke 7, starting 
in verse 36. This is what it says. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. Now I'm gonna pause right there because you gotta love Jesus, right? He's invited over to a Pharisee's house and, and he goes, he's invited to this dinner party and Jesus comes walking in. He's like, you got yourself a lazy boy anywhere, right? You know, he's like, this is how I like to eat dinner, right? And so it literally says in the text, he reclined at the table. Verse 37, it says, a woman in that town who lived a what? Who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair. She kissed them and poured perfume on them. So, I mean, quite a vulnerable moment, right? What is the only thing that we know about this woman? What does the text say? The text says that she's sinful, right? So, so this is the only information that we know about this woman, which I would say this is a pretty wide way to describe a person because I, I would venture to say that every single one of us in this room probably qualifies in the same category, right? Yeah. Everybody here a sinner? All right, 100% counted among us, feeling good this morning, right? So, 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 so this is just a, a, a generalization, but the Pharisees go out of their way to communicate, this is a sinful woman, meaning we are not. And I love what happens here because what we see is this woman found out that Jesus was having dinner at the Pharisee's house. What's amazing is, was she invited to the dinner? She wasn't invited to the dinner, but she found out where Jesus was and she decided to go there. She decided to crash the party. And with her, she brought a little alabaster jar of perfume. Probably looked much like this. And, and she walks right up to Jesus, who's reclining at the table. And she begins to pour out the perfume that she has. She begins weeping at his feet, touching his feet with her hair. I think it's safe to say that this was most likely quite a vulnerable moment, right? I mean, you can imagine everyone in the room was kind of going, what is going on, right? Who, who invited her and how is this now happening? And, and, and perhaps there was even a feeling of awkwardness in the room, right? And the passage goes on in the next verse, it says in verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, and I love that Luke records that, because it says that he said it to himself, which means he said it loud enough under his breath so that Luke could record it in the gospel, right? So, so he's kind of like, you know, speaking under his breath and he's got all of his judgment to this woman and to Jesus about what's going on. And it says, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Talk about judgment, right? So the Pharisee kind of sets up this silent trap for Jesus. He sets up this silent trap for Jesus. If he really were a prophet, he would know what this woman is all about. And I love, I love that this is here in the passage because we so do this in our relationships with one another, don't we? We set out these little traps for each other. We don't tell each other that we've set the traps, but we set the traps. And we have these ideas in our mind as to how the other person is supposed to respond, what they're supposed to say, how they're supposed to act. And when they don't, we trap them. All of you are like, I don't do that. <laughs> You're lying. You do. We all do this in our relationships. I did it this week. I did it on Thursday. I'll tell you about a trap that I did. Jarrett and Sean were actually out of town this week. They were at a conference. They were over in London. And so we didn't have much connection uh, because of the time change and that kind of thing. 
And I had in my mind a picture about how Jarrett was going to come home. I kind of pictured like how he was going to walk into the house on Thursday. And, and, and the picture in my mind went kind of like this. Like he was just going to walk in and be like, oh, babe, it's so good to see you. I missed you so much. All the lunches you made this week for the kids and all the math homework that you helped out with. And I know that math homework is hard for you. You know, all the things that you did at work and, and all the things that you got done and that you accomplished. Oh, blessed woman that I call my wife. <laughs> it's so good to be home and in your presence. It kind of went like that in my mind, okay? That's kind of how I pictured him walking through the door. And thus, the trap was set. <laughs> because that's not how he walked in. He walked in exhausted, he was dealing with jet lag, he had things he had to get done by the end of that day, so he walked in and was like, hey, it's so good to be home, I love you. Fast kiss, like a peck, right? And then he got about his business. And so I went to the next layer of the trap. <laughs> Which you all know what the next layer of the trap is. It's the silent treatment, right? Friends, I'm, I am good. I'm really good at this. And so, and so he's like, how are you? Fine. <laughs> how was everything at, at work this week? Good. <laughs> how was that lecture you went to with your friend Donna the other night? How, how was that? Fine. And after about three or four of those one answer um, responses, he's like, what's up with you? <laughs> what is going on? And I was like, okay, am I willing to let myself be seen? Am, am I willing to be honest with what's really going on? And so I just said, I had some really challenging things at work this week. Um, I, I was struggling with this. I really wanted your insight and your support on this, and then I, I couldn't reach you, and so I had moments of feeling alone. I had moments of feeling scared. And I just really wanted you to come home and I wanted you to see me and I wanted your encouragement. And what's worse is I didn't tell you that that's what I most wanted. And I'm sorry. I set a trap. And will you forgive me? And it was such a great moment for us. And I'm so grateful I took breath in that moment because I realized what was happening. And this is exactly what the Pharisee is doing in this text. He's setting a trap, but he's setting a trap for Jesus, right? Okay, you can't set a trap for Jesus. He's the son of God. He gets out of it every single time. But the Pharisee sets a trap for Jesus here. And it goes on and it says in verse 40, Jesus answered him, Simon, and I love Jesus. This is the first time he calls him by name. Simon. I have something to tell you. Simon, kind of you picture him sitting up in his chair. Tell me, teacher, as if I wasn't just setting a trap for you. <laughs> Jesus goes in to one of his parables. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? So Jesus tells this random but not so random story, doesn't he? And Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Now I'm, I'm sure that Simon felt really good about himself in that moment because he got the answer right, right? Jesus asks you a question, you get the answer right. I'm going to feel good about myself, right? So I imagine Simon is having a moment and he's feeling good about himself, but Jesus shifts all the attention in that moment, back to the woman. It says, then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and she wiped them with her hair. You didn't even give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. 
You don't put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love. Pay attention to that. As her great love has been shown. Whoever has been forgiven little loves little. So Jesus praises this woman's vulnerability. And not only that, he names her vulnerability as love, doesn't he? He says this moment of vulnerability is a moment of love. It's almost like he, he, like, he, he gives an equation of what's happening in the room. And he almost says to everyone that's gathered there, great vulnerability equals great love. But little vulnerability equals little love. It says, then Jesus said to her, and he looked at her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, I mean, who is this guy? Who is this guy who even forgives sins? And Jesus doesn't even pay attention to what's being said in the moment. And he looks at the woman in her eyes and says, your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. Jesus sends the, the woman away, blessing her faith, blessing her vulnerability, blessing her act of great love, and he invites her to now go and live in peace. And I love this story because this is so quintessential Jesus, isn't it? That the thing that's most acceptable, the thing that's most appropriate, he does the total opposite. He, he, he welcomes this woman. And he, and he highlights the beauty of her pouring out this perfume, her pouring out her tears, her vulnerability at his feet. And he says, this, this, everybody, this is what love looks like. If you're wondering, if you've been trying to figure out what true love looks like, this is what it looks like. It's when you pour yourself out, when you let yourself be seen, when you choose to no longer camouflage or cover yourself up, when you come out of hiding. That's what vulnerability looks like. And in so many ways, we are just like this alabaster jar. <laughs> In so many ways, we are just this conglomeration of all kinds of things going on inside of us. We're a mixed bag of, of love and joy and fear and excitement and experiences and moments that we don't want anyone to ever know about. All of that is inside of us at every single moment. And the question is, how much of you will you pour out in your relationships? And I think for so many of us, we have spent a significant portion of our lives making sure that we only pour out a safe portion. We, we've spent so much time making sure that, that the lid is secure on who we are. Don't let anybody see who I really am or what's really going on. And in the process of making sure that we are safely secure, we begin to forget that what makes you vulnerable is actually what makes you valid. What makes you vulnerable is what makes you valid. Maybe this is a better way to say it. Vulnerability is proof that you're human. Vulnerability is the proof that you are human. And every time we try to hide ourselves from one another, every time we refuse to let ourselves be seen, every time we allow a heist to occur and we throw ourselves behind these bars, it's as if we are trying to deny our own humanity. And what vulnerability says in a relationship is I want to see you. And I want you to see me. And this can happen in our marriages, in our dating relationships. This can even happen with your boss. It can 
can happen with a coworker, a family member. This can happen with your children because vulnerability starts the exact same way every single time. Vulnerability always requires a willingness for someone to go first. It always requires a willingness for somebody to say, I'll go first. I'll let you see who I am. And it's what we see with the woman that walked into the room and started pouring herself out at the feet of Jesus. She let herself be seen. She didn't wait and wonder and hedge her bets on how Jesus would respond. Remember, she wasn't even invited to the party. She didn't kind of like just dip her toe into the water of vulnerability to see if it would be safe and test to see if she would be received and have her vulnerability welcomed. She didn't even ask Jesus, the son of God, to go first. She poured herself out and she let herself be seen. I love what Brene Brown says. She says, vulnerability sounds like truth and it feels like courage. And truth and courage aren't always comfortable, but they are never weakness. They're never weakness. Letting yourself be seen is never weakness. And vulnerability that comes from a healthy desire to let someone know the truth about who you are. And let me stress, the healthy desire. The healthy desire to let someone know the truth about who you are is never weakness. And it will change the quality of your relationships. I've found this to be true in my own life. I found this to be true in my relationships that I experience my most authentic and alive moments when I let go of the fear of being vulnerable. When I let go of the fear of being vulnerable, and this is one of my core fears. You see, we are most vulnerable when we don't fear being vulnerable. And when we let go and allow ourselves to be seen, the relationship shifts. Earlier this week, I, uh, I met up with a friend of mine, and uh, we walk together once a week early in the morning. And when I say we walk together once a week, um, seven out of 10 times, we go to Starbucks <laughs> and we drink coffee. But it always says in my calendar, walking. And so I, I, I still qualify it as exercise. And so my alarm went off at 5.30 a.m. And I looked out the window and it was so dark out. And I texted her and I was like, it's really dark. She's like, I know, it's really dark. And I said, let's meet at Starbucks. And, and so, you know, I, I, I got up. Um, I, I threw on my yoga pants. I threw on my sweatshirt. I, I gave her the gift of brushing my teeth um, and walked out the door and headed over to Starbucks. And, and we do this weekly with one another. And we were sitting there uh, at the table and we were just sharing our lives and we were sharing what was going on with one another. I, I shared about what had happened the day before when Jared got home. Um, and we were experiencing and exchanging vulnerability in our friendship. We were letting ourselves be seen. And I realized while I was sitting there and I started telling her that I was feeling some fear that I was going to be speaking on vulnerability this weekend and that I really just wanted to show Brene Brown's TED talk on it instead of actually give the talk myself. And I was telling her that I was feeling this fear. And I realized while I was sitting there that what I was experiencing while I was sitting there was vulnerability. I was feeling it. I was tasting it. I was experiencing it in our friendship with one another as we were both equally showing up and letting ourselves be seen. And I had this moment where I felt like the Holy Spirit was speaking to me and I was like, oh no, 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 nope. I'm not, I'm not interested in that prompting. I think this might just be some bad coffee that's going on here. <laughs> But I felt the Holy Spirit press in again. 
and just say, so Jeannie, if you were willing to show up just as you are with this dear friend, what's keeping you from showing up with Soul City? What's keeping you from showing up with these people that you love? Like, would you be willing to show up the exact same way that you're sitting here in this Starbucks, in your yoga pants, and your sweatshirt, and your undone hair, <laughs> your makeupless face? Are you actually willing to show up and say, I'll go first? Amen. So Soul City, I'm showing up saying I'm willing to go first. I'm willing to go first because I don't think any of us got up this morning and came here because we, we want to pretend, right? We want to play church with one another. I think we want to be seen, don't we? I have this new friend. Um, we've just known each other for about a little over a month now. And um, we, we started getting to know one another. And I think it was like the second or third time that we were together. And she said to me, hey, you know, I'm really enjoying getting to know you. I'm really enjoying the time that we're spending with each other. But I, I just want to say something up front. I was like, OK, awesome. I have a ton of issues with God, with the church, with faith, and with religion. So if you're good with that, we can keep going. <laughs> and I was like, oh gosh, I'm so glad you said something. Because you know what? I have a ton of issues with God. And I have a ton of issues with religion and talk about faith and, oh my gosh, my issues with the church and I even work at one. <laughs> and I just said, I'm not in a relationship with you because of this. I, I hope one day you come into the doors of Soul City Church because we're not about pretending. We're not about putting on a spiritual show where our lives are all cleaned up with one another. We're about coming in as we are and extending the love of Jesus onto one another's lives so that each of us can be seen and put back together into the wholeness that Jesus desires. So I just said, if and when that's something you desire, I would love to sit next to you. In fact, I'm gonna buy you a seat. She's like, you buy seats there? And I was like, don't worry about it. <laughs> and friends, I think this is what every one of us desires here, isn't it? We desire this in our relationship. It's the kind of community that we want to be a part of, the kind of community that we want to bring our friends to. Friends, this is the kind of community that my marriage needs. I don't want to be the kind of pastor that just works on this mission. I want to be in this mission. I want my marriage to be transformed. I want my kids to grow up in a church where they experience the transforming love of Jesus. And they're not just the pastor's kids around here. I want all of us to create a space with one another where we say, I'm willing to go first and I'm going to let myself be seen. And I know that there are some of you here this morning and that is the heart's cry of your life right now. There's a relationship that you're in and you know, you know that the Holy Spirit has been pushing on you to go first. You know that there's a relationship where you have been locked up and you are experiencing a heist because you've allowed yourself to stay in hiding. Some of you have closed your heart and you have sealed yourself off and it has been so long since you have taken the lid off and allowed yourself to be poured out. And I wonder today, I wonder today if you'd be willing to say, I'm willing to stop running. 
I'm willing to come out of hiding. I'm willing to let Jesus unlock where I have caused a heist. And to experience the gift with God, to experience the gift with yourself, to experience the gift with one another of vulnerability, of truly letting yourself be seen. You know, what's so amazing to me is that it's in the opening of your heart that your heart is most healed. And so many of us, we have learned how to master the art of closing our heart of closing ourselves off from one another, of being so afraid to let ourselves be seen, of of literally putting ourselves behind bars in our relationship. And the woman that came to Jesus' feet, she said, I'm going to just pour it all out. And you know, this story is told in all four of the Gospels. The story of the woman that came to the feet of Jesus. And in one of the Gospels, it even says that every time the Gospel is preached, this woman will be remembered for her faithfulness. So even here today, 2,000 years later, we are remembering a woman that said, I'm going to take the lid off and I'm going to pour all of myself out to Jesus. And I believe the reason she knew she could do that is because Jesus has poured himself out for all of us. Because friends, every time you go first, you need to know someone else has already gone first for you. Oh, this is the good news of the gospel. Jesus has gone. I'm going to start wearing these shoes because I can jump in them. (laughs) This is the good news of the gospel. He has gone first. He has made a way. He has shown us what vulnerability looks like. And the invitation to you today is, will you come out of hiding with God, with one another, maybe even with yourself today? We're going to move into a time of worship, and we're going to do this a little bit different. Usually we, we end all of our gatherings with us singing, but today we want a prayer to be sung over you for you to allow the words to marinate and and to, to penetrate into your heart and to allow the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit can only do and call you into the safety of his vulnerability. So I want to invite you to pray with me and then Fabi and the team will sing this over us. So Jesus, with our hands open, and perhaps even more importantly, with our hearts open. We come before you now, and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would do what only you could do inside of us. Only you are the one that can truly heal a human heart. But God, we get to do the work of opening ourselves up to you. So Jesus, I pray that this would be a shame-free space right now, that your Holy Spirit would literally cover over this space, cover over our uh, other rooms where people are watching this, and literally that this would be a shame-free space and that you would allow us the freedom to come into the safety and the love of your presence, to come out of hiding, and to come home. We pray this in your name. Amen.